turning out. I, I really appreciate this interest in ravens. Um, I'm Pat Mundy. I teach at Montana Tech. And common ravens, Corvus corvax here, or corax like you see here, have been part of my daily life for well over 30 years, since I moved to Butte, here along the Continental Divide. My home in nearby Walkerville seems to be the center of a breeding pair's territory. They often herald the dawn from uh, the big spruce tree in front of my bedroom window, and my mile and a half walk to Montana Tech seems to be between a rookery and two food sources, the interstate highway, roadkill, and the landfill. So rare is the day that I don't see a juvenile conspiracy or a mating pair or two of ravens pass over. Winter or summer, my office window, walking around campus, uptown Butte, I enjoy the sights and sounds of ravens. I like ravens. They're smart, inquisitive, but cautious, familiar with a very large territory, and they seem to like the same kind of places that I like to live and roam. <laughs> so cross country or backcountry skiing, trout fishing, backpacking and hiking, and hunting define the seasons of my year. While I'm engaged in these things throughout the mountains, prairies, rivers, here in southwest Montana, ravens are usually part of the picture. One of the largest conspiracies I've ever seen consisted of 70 or more ravens. <clears throat> they assembled on the top of Wesco Peak in mid-August of the year 2000, and I was up there with my young daughter on a backpacking trip. <clears throat> That's the day that the Music Broad fire, really big forest fire, blew up. <clears throat> We're sitting there on top of the mountain watching this, you know, virtually, you know, funnel cloud rising <clears throat> from the Music Broad area 15 miles to the west. Suddenly, we're surrounded by ravens who seem to be just as amazed as we were. The wind drifted <clears throat> the smoke over our heads, and it rained pine needles and spruce needles. And the ravens were just as inquisitive as we were about going, looking, picking them up. It was quite amazing. <clears throat> so I like talking with ravens, though my ravenish vocabulary is pretty limited to a <clears throat> maybe a Right? <clears throat> it's enough to attract passing ravens, and occasionally, what did I say, to enrage them. <laughs> I'm a better listener than talker, and I've had ravens lead me to various large animal carcasses and, while hunting, to elk. Listen to me, said the raven, but it is so difficult to speak your language. Do you understand ravenish? If so, I can tell you much better. So that's from Hans Christian Andersen. And like J.R. Tolkien and a lot of other writers, he was drawing on Norse mythology regarding the communicative power of ravens. So the Norse god Odin carried on his shoulders two ravens, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> uh, Hugin thought <clears throat> and Munin memory. They made a daily flight over the earth, acting as Odin's eyes and ears, reporting back to him on world events. So Odin, as the chief god of Norse mythology, dates to at least the 6th century, and along with similar Germanic forms like Woden or Wutan, persisted well into the Christian era. So in addition to receiving this news of the world from his ravens, Odin was a shaman who could assume the form of a raven and fly around the earth. Like Odin, 
Mortals could also learn a lot from observing ravens and other birds. So reading and interpreting bird behaviors as omens <clears throat> was a big part of the Greco-Roman world and other pre-modern European civilizations. So ravens and other corvids frequently figured into the auguries, the fortune tellers described by Cicero or Livius or Pliny in Roman literature. As religious officials, these augurs read bird calls and behaviors to foretell the future. Given the raven's connection with death as a scavenger of human corpses, it seemed a fitting vehicle through which to communicate with the dead to the souls of the underworld. Ovid's writing emphasized the untrustworthiness of ravens, they're kind of a trickster uh, figure, as well as being a bearer of bad news. At a practical level, just day to day, ravens served two important functions in early modern Europe. They heralded the dawn, much like they do from my bedroom window and at a time before clocks and uh, bell towers, that was useful. But they also scavenged the dead and dying corpses of soldiers on the battlefields. The author of Beowulf, as well as Roman writers such as Apollinarius, Martialis, they often begin their stories with the calls of the raven heralding the morning. So in modern Western civilization, ravens gradually acquire a really bad rap as an untrustworthy and evil bird. This is traced to early Christian and Jewish interpretations of the raven's role in helping Noah find land. Despite the way that later scholars demonized ravens, Genesis 8-7 is ambiguous on this point, stating only that Noah sent out the raven, it went to and fro upon the waters until they had dried up upon the earth. After this, Noah sent forth a series of doves with more definitive results. Nonetheless, theologians from the fourth century on generally wrote that ravens had failed Noah and characterized them as an unclean bird, picking at the dead body from the flood here, a symbol of evil and even the enemy. Apparently, it was easy to ignore the nobler roles of ravens in the Old Testament, such as when ravens were commanded by God to feed the prophet Elijah during his sojourn in the wilderness. By the 17th century, the raven's reputation in Europe was sealed, though ravens may have played a crucial and positive role in scavenging human carcasses, for example, after London's Great Fire of 1666. The sight seems to have provoked only hatred and revulsion. Bounties and more indirect measures, such as forest clearing, led to the extinction of ravens throughout much of England and the rest of Europe. Though ravens are now protected in Europe, many Germans still believe they kill too many nestlings and even calves by pecking their eyes out. And they're still pressuring to have ravens removed from the landscape. Western science and philosophy, our culture, has often severed connections with nature with non-human animals. So I think as our environmental problems loom larger, healing the divide between humans and other animals, like ravens, is an important part of addressing our alienation with nature. So I seek to rehabilitate, rehabilitate the relationship between humans and other animals using the raven as an example. As an ethnographic model, we can look to indigenous cultures throughout the circumpolar northern worlds, the taiga, the boreal forest. 
Many of these cultures feature ravens and close relatives like the Wiscata Jack, the Whiskey Jack, or Grey Jay, in myths and other important stories, and as totem animals, as animals that family groups identify with. Often, raven is identified with speech, various powers of communication, stealing the light from the sun. And the anthropologist Richard K. Nelson introduces his account of a year spent living among the Koyukon people in central Alaska with this meditation on ravens. He writes, during the many months I had spent among the Koyukon, I had gradually begun to look quite differently at ravens. I began not only to know about them, but also to feel the further dimension in nature that was so preeminently important to my teachers. Ravens had become more than just beautiful and intelligent birds. I found myself watching them and feeling watched in return watched by something more than the raven's gleaming black eye, I found myself listening to their calls, not to just to enjoy their strange, you know, ventriloquial gurglings, but also to hear what they might be saying. So the Koyukon, like the Tlingit, the Haida, and other northern peoples, take ravens seriously. They're a part of myth, as you might gather from that raven transformation mask. Ravens bridge the con a connection between the human and the animal world. They're often a trickster figure. And the elevation <coughs> of raven in myth also doesn't alter the way these people regard ravens in day-to-day -day life. So for example, people who deceive others, people who lie in order to fulfill their own needs, or those who are not good hunters, might be mocked by calling them, oh, just like a raven. Even scorned, right? So when this person comes around, other people will <coughs> give a raven's call to that person. At a practice, no offense to all of you. <laughs> At a practical level, hunters look to the flight of passing ravens as a sign of whether the hunt will be successful. They might call out to the raven to ask for good luck. So the ethologist Bernd Heinrich quotes an Athapascan woman who says, one of the things we say to Raven while we hunt is, seek out seats on Nopalti Oak. Which means, Grandpa, drop us a pack. If the bird rolls, it's a sign of good luck. In rationalizing this, a Koyukon explained, it's just like talking to God. That's why we talk to Raven. He created the world. Heinrich also visited with Inuit peoples at several villages on Baffin Island, north of Hudson Bay. Like the Koyukon, these Inuit hunters also describe speaking to ravens. Echoing my own experience as a hunter, the Inuit and the Koyukon also <coughs> report that ravens do indeed sometimes dip a wing, make that half roll, and lead them to prey. So the engagement between human hunters and ravens is very similar to the engagement between ravens and other hunters like wolves. So following the introduction to wolves in 1994, Yellowstone National Park was a great laboratory for studying raven-wolf interactions. The abundance of elk made for easy wolf kills. Food was so abundant that the wolves would often just sort of kill and high grade, right? Take the choices parts, move on to new prey. So ravens, other scavenging birds like bald eagles and golden eagles were quick to capitalize on all of this free meat. Typically, more than 30 ravens would feed at a given elk kill. Wolf researchers found they could locate wolves and their fresh kills 
by watching for flocks of ravens. Heinrich, who had observed great wariness on the part of New England ravens in how they would approach a carcass, was amazed to find that in Yellowstone, ravens flew over the wolves while they killed an elk and then immediately descended to feed with the wolves. He speculates that the coevolution of ravens and wolves, hence the colloquial name of raven as wolf bird, <coughs> makes ravens uncomfortable and wary in a world without wolves. Ravens benefit from their association with wolves primarily through, fancy word here, kleptoparasitic foraging strategy. In other words, they're stealing, right, parasitizing on whatever the wolves kill. It's a wonderful term. One or two ravens almost invariably accompany wolves while they're hunting. Once an animal's killed, the raven scout calls out to recruit other ravens to the carcass. Thus, flocks of ravens discover wolf-killed carcasses almost immediately. <clears throat> if a raven finds a large mammal carcass, maybe hit by a car, died of starvation in the winter, it's of no avail since a raven's beak is not strong enough to tear through the hide of an elk. So they need to recruit wolves or other predators to help zip open that carcass so they can have dinner. Though ravens don't seem to follow elk or other large prey, they are quick to locate and harass injured elk. And they'll draw the attention of wolves and coyotes right, to those elk. Ravens also frequently associate with wolves away from the kill site. If you watch the wolves in the winter in Yellowstone, you'll see the ravens hopping around, maybe biting at the wolves' tails, maybe playing chase with the wolf pups. Maybe this play is a means for ravens to learn how to interact safely, because wolves, after all, are large right, and, and pretty deadly predators. And they will kill and eat a raven if it's within reach of their jaws. So wolves, while tolerant of ravens, they certainly don't kill for them. On the contrary, there's good evidence that wolves have evolved into a social pack-oriented animal in order to maximize meat consumption, thereby leaving as little as possible for wolves or other scavengers. While this did not seem very important with artificially high elk populations, in Yellowstone those first few years, prey is usually not so abundant, and during certain seasons for wolves, it's really scarce. A flock of ravens can consume 80 pounds or more of meat from a carcass in a single day. Wow. I've gone back where I've killed an elk, looked at the gut pile even the next day, it is sometimes just gone, right? not even right, a scrap left. So here's the ethologist language. The scientists say, the reduced per capita rate of consumption in larger wolf packs is offset by the benefit of increased frequency of prey capture and reduced loss of food to scavengers. So the optimal pack size for wolves depends on the amount lost to scavengers as well as the size and the abundance of the prey. But based on studies like this, wolf uh, ethologists Marsloff and Angel speculate that coevolution with ravens played a pretty important role not just for wolves, but for humans as well, and for human hunters, human scavengers. So whether it's humans killing other humans on the battlefields or wolves killing elk in Yellowstone National Park, ravens have learned to associate, associate with human and non-human predators. Prior to the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone, elk populations, as many of you would remember, were really high, artificially high, beyond the carrying capacity of the land to support them. In Wyoming, they set up those artificial feeding grounds at places around Jackson Hole. 
These attracted a lot of elk and a lot of elk hunters. That made for high hunter success in that area and a lot of gut piles. Ravens would migrate to the Jackson Hole area just during hunting season to take advantage of that food source. Furthermore, ravens in other hunting areas outside the park, like around here, learn a foraging strategy whereby they hear and are attracted to gunshots. As my friend, the wildlife biologist, it's a great name for a wildlife biologist, Crow White, as Crow White titled an article about it, hunters ring the dinner bell for ravens. Ravens make a wide range of calls, apparently to communicate with one another. It's difficult to know what these specific calls mean to other ravens, but there's good evidence that their communication affects other ravens and shapes raven society. It's a language. Ravens typically breed between the age of three and seven years. They mate for life and establish a territory that they try to defend from other ravens. Prior to choosing a mate, like the big gangs that you see flying around Butte, they form these loosely organized juvenile conspiracies, anywhere from a dozen to a hundred or more birds. These gangs, these juvenile conspiracies, are composed of vagrant individuals that fly maybe 60, day, 60 miles a day in search of food. So from the hills north of Butte, up around the Molten, along the interstate, you know, over to the landfill and points beyond. When one or more of it, these individuals finds a large food source, such as a big game carcass, they yell in order to recruit other ravens, other juveniles. And by feeding as a crowd, the juveniles will overwhelm the territorial adults. Right? So territorial adults, they don't make a lot of noise when they find food. It's like mom and dad, they're going to stash it away for the kids. But the juvenile gangs, the more the merrier, and it's a big right, carcass party. So in engaging with wild ravens, we human animals recognize something like ourselves. We have some affinity. Raven intelligence, vocalization, playfulness, and socialization make them appear very human-like. And it's not surprising that cultures like the Anglo-Saxons and the Inuits and the Athapascans all cast ravens as powerful mythological figures. Recent scholarship in animal cognition and the evolution of intelligence supports human recognition of ravens as a kindred animal. In assessing the evidence, Nathan Emery even poses a theoretical question. Can we think of ravens and other corvids as feathered apes? In considering how animals can recognize meaning in other species, we can paraphrase the German writer Goethe in saying, if the flower were not bee-like and the bee were not flower-like, the unison could never be successful. So we see these relationships among species all through nature, right? So humans, when we look at a flower, it's a yellow flower. When a pollinator, when a bee looks at it, they see into the infrared range we can't see. They see that bullseye in the center of the flower that says dinner is here. So despite difficulties in studying communication between humans and other animals, environmental communication scholars are uniquely situated with theories and methods to help bridge this divide. My interest, my particular interest, is in revealing the perspectives or the ways of engagement between wild ravens and us. Additionally, I'm what David Peterson, who writes about hunters, called a spiritual hunter. 
I draw on my own engagement with wild nature. It's a big reason why I hunt. As a boy growing up in the Alleghenies, <clears throat> wild turkey populations were just rebounding from a century of near extinction. They were especially prevalent on the Allegheny Plateau near our house. So my grandfather and I, along with our friend Bernie Dutka, began hunting them during the spring turkey season. <clears throat> Mr. Dutka taught me about paying close attention to everything that was going on in the woods. So before dawn, crows would begin calling as they left their roost and would often mark the location of a turkey flock. By listening for the crows, moving quickly into position, it was possible to set up near the turkeys and then call them into range when they were most susceptible of being fooled, first thing in the morning. The summer I turned 16, I passed the driving test and began hunting on my own. <clears throat> so while still hunting deer with a rifle, I often would encounter these cheerful, friendly flocks of chickadees. And following Mr. Dutka's lead, I wondered, what sort of sign might this be? <clears throat> the chickadees would flock to me, fly off, maybe return one or more times. One day, I carefully and slowly followed them, and they led me to a bedded deer, just like ravens will lead wolves to elk. This was no act of altruism, for the chickadees are often the first bird to arrive and feed upon a gut pile left by a human hunter. They especially favor the suet-rich fat from the body cavity, and I began the practice of leaving a hunk of suet hanging on a tree so that my little helper chickadees could have it to themselves and not have to share it with a gluttonous fox. <laughs> so upon moving here to Butte, I was struck by the prevalence of ravens both in town and in the surrounding mountains and forest. Based on what I had learned about chickadees and crows as a young man in the Alleghenies, I paid attention to ravens and other corvids while hunting. So ravens, along with Wiscata jacks, some of you might say whiskey jacks or gray jays, like the one in this photo, led me to many elk. Several years after moving to Butte, I held a class discussion about the human relationship with nature. We were talking about what is a weed, you know, a gnat weed, and then the topic got on birds. I explained my reverence for and connection to corvids and, other, and ravens. A middle-aged student, we'll call him Charlie, expressed his contempt for ravens. Filthy birds, he said, and he talked of shooting them whenever he got the chance. Well, Charlie, as it turned out, was a singularly unsuccessful elk hunter. He was older than I was at that time, a non-traditional student. He had never killed an elk in decades of hunting. I couldn't help but think that his hatred for a species like the raven represented, not just for him, but even with our culture, some kind of deeper disease a disease that expresses itself at the individual level, but sometimes at a broader cultural level um, as well. The anthropologist Levi Strauss, not like the blue jeans, in pondering the relationship between humans and other animals wrote, natural species are chosen by people not because they are good to eat, but because they are good to think. As an anthropologist, heavily influenced by a theory of language, semiotics, Levi Strauss theorized that we think of with animals as a sign in our head. In other words, in the human mind, non-human animals, wild animals like ravens, 
serve as a mental construct for this sort of inner world, this inner dialogue, especially when it comes to cultural myths, the stories that we tell. He pioneered this approach in thinking about the way the constituent parts of those myths, meaningful elements like life and death, food and hunting, form a pattern in stories like the Oedipus myth, you know, Oedipus Rex, you know, kill your father, marry your mother, or the Zuni emergence myth. So in Levi-Strauss's terms, ravens are good to think, both because of their similarity to us and because of their practical usefulness in helping us find game if we're a hunter or find land if we're a sailor. Think of Noah. But Levi-Strauss was primarily interested in the role of animals in myth. And my primary interest is our broader connections. I'm interested in how we engage with ravens and construct meaning in an everyday kind of dynamic process. <clears throat> so as structurally embodied signs in our head, our patterned experience with ravens forms a basis of an ongoing relationship. We hear the raven's diverse calls based on our own vocabulary and syntax. We construct it as a sign of raven intelligence. We want to think they're pretty smart. So we observe the raven leading us to our quarry, you know, based on our cooperation with other human hunters, we see it as a sign of raven intention and connection. The peculiar similar association of ravens with wolves and ravens with people further reinforces it, this relationship. Keep in mind that our dogs are in the same species as wolves, right? We've, we've right, sort of adapted them from wild wolves. We talk with our dogs. We use them to find drugs at the airport, maybe, right? Or game if we're a hunter. And thus, dogs and ravens and wolves can become inextricably linked to the stories we tell about the world. But ravens are not merely an object of thought that we sort of think about, tell stories about. Instead, we can interact with them day to day, construct meaning as we go, and try to understand our world through them. It expands our world. So while a raven might make a classic wing dip, right, <clears throat> when we call out to it, it might also engage us in a lot of other ways. I was once midway through my walk home when a small flock of ravens flew overhead. I called out to them thinking, you know, I might get a passing answer or two. And they all mobbed me. They were really angry about something. <laughs> so back to that earlier, right? When I have no idea what I said, but it was clearly the, the wrong thing. Right? Uh, so let's see if we can. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, probably a lot of you have had that experience, right? Here, here, you. You're kind of walking along. And Raven swoops around to check you out, you know, calls once or twice. What do they say? Are they just kind of checking in? Or they say, following me, you know, there are some deer over here by the Berkeley pit. We can shoot one. I don't know. <laughs> you climb a mountain peak here in southwest Montana, almost always ravens will show up. They'll play on the thermals, and they like messing with you. Now, oftentimes, as you're hiking along, pop up over the ridge behind you, fly very close. You know, you're kind of sweating and sucking wind trying to get up the mountain. And then they'll croak at you like this one did. And it's like, whoa. 
they like to do that. They try to get me to like fall over the ridge, maybe, so they have dinner, I don't know. <laughs> In considering the possibility of human-raven communications or interactions, I like a quotation from the German philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. He says, if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. Right? So, so I don't, I'm not naive enough to think right, that we can actually speak um, raven language, but they're clearly saying something. So when a raven dips its wing, rolls in flight, it does look like a person right, tipping a pack off their shoulders. Well, ravens, of course, they don't carry packs, and it's not likely that ravens are copying us when we throw a pack off our shoulders. Nonetheless, this sign vehicle of a raven dipping its wings, as you see with the raven above the deer uh, near my home uh, in Walkerville, certainly means something. So through this performative act, we, see, we can compare that to the way some of our companion species act. So think about seeing eye dogs, or drug sniffing dogs, or bird dogs, right? They commonly provide us an animal's view of the world if we're open to it. They have pragmatic outcomes. So the guide dog, right, tells its companion to step up for the curb. The canine dog at the customs gate, you know, tips off the customs police to somebody that might have drugs in their bag. The bird dog signals to us that it's found a bird, a hot, fresh scent, right? Something that we might shoot. So signs are everywhere in nature. They're not limited to what we see. They're not limited to what we can read. Consider the physical track or the chemical scent of a fox or that visual bullseye I showed you for a flower that marks it for a bee. So as John Dealey wrote, animal survival depends on getting it right. The manner in which the physical environment is incorporated into its world of objects when it comes to food, sex, or danger. Our dogs do this, ravens do this. We can tap into a bigger world in that way. So thinking through ravens, I think, is for those of us lucky enough to be here in Butte, where there are constant, right, sort of presence, is a good way for us to bridge that human nature divide. It's magical to watch interactions between wolves and ravens or the way that they'll engage us just in our day-to-day -day lives. Aldo Leopold, some of you might have read him, he's a classic biologist who wrote about uh, wildlife management here in the West. He watched a wolf die. He had killed a wolf. And in that moment, he learned, as he wrote, to think like a mountain in listening to the howl of a wolf and in an engagement with wild nature that went beyond just the animals that we could hunt, that went beyond to an engagement with nature that would change our relationship to the world. From that new perspective, we can imagine a new kind of future. Imagining the future is a way of storytelling. Outdoor magazines are big on this. They're full of stories, right, about hunters imagining killing an elk or other animal. Sometimes these stories rise to the level of literature. Uh, think of Dyson's Out of Africa or, uh, or, or William Faulkner's The Bear. <coughs> It's the human author's story. Is it so unlike a story that a raven tells? We have no direct access to what a raven thinks and imagines, but the ability of a raven to communicate the presence of an elk, whether to me or to a wolf, can lead us to think about the story that the raven tells in its own mind. 
The Raven models a possible world, communicates that story to another species, and it's a practical story that might result in a full belly for the human hunter or the wolf, as well as for the ravens. So the role of the raven in creating and telling this story, casting us, a human hunter, as a character in its story, and helping shape the conclusion of that story. I think that's an amazing performance of human wild animal engagement. So when a foxhound hunts with their human companions, the hounds have a kind of awareness about who they are and what their job is. Right? The hounds employ their instincts shaped by generations of breeding, and the hound knows what it's supposed to do. I think ravens have that same kind of awareness. They, they know in their relationship what we might expect of them. So whether in our own backyard or, or up in the wilderness, we have an unprecedented opportunity to observe and to connect with wild nature. I'm not saying we can go back to some you know, mythic Garden of Eden where people talk with animals, but we can draw on our communication, our relationships, to better understand our, our world. So ravens are not these you know, filthy, evil birds. Wolves are not gluttonous, evil animals. They're also not benevolent gods or, or mythic figures either. They're real embodied creatures, and they might just as soon scavenge our carcass as the carcass of an elk, right? But through these interactions we have with them, we can learn more about the world. So thinking with, thinking through, living with ravens helps us to grasp our dynamic and complex relationship with the non-human world. Building this relationship helps us value not just other creatures, but the interconnectedness of this world. Ravens evolved in a landscape with wolves. Grizzlies, you know, all these other big, fierce predators. John Muir, the writer, founder of the Sierra Club, wrote, when we try to pick anything out of nature by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So raven or wolf bird is hitched to all these other large predators in a food web that includes the ungulate prey, you know, deer or, or uh, wolf or, or, or elk, excuse me. And we, the human animal, are also part of that interconnected natural system. Thank you. <laughs>